Okay, ladies and gentlemen, right, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon. Right, I think it's time we got started. I think we've had lunch, we've had a time, some time to socialize, so we are now going to begin the plenary session for this afternoon. And my name is Alvin Sweeney. I shall be chairing the session this afternoon. I'm a member of the science education faculty here at the UV Mona campus. And as part of my chair duties this afternoon, I have the honor of introducing our plenary speaker, Professor Daniel Birgos. I practice that. Professor Daniel Birgos of the Universidad Internacional de la Rioja in Spain. I practice that also. All right. In uh, preparing for this, I was asked to introduce the speaker a week or so ago, two weeks or so ago, and in preparing to do this, I, as many of you do, as many of my students do, I took the opportunity to Google him, Google is now a verb, to Google Professor Birgos, and if I speak about all the accomplishments that I noted, we would be here for quite a while. So I will content myself with, with referring to the biographical notes that he provided, Gergos is a professor, co professor of education and communication technologies, vice chancellor for knowledge transfer and technology, UNESCO chair on e learning, and also ICDE chair in open educational resources at the university I mentioned, Universidad Internacional de la Rio, Rio, Rioja. Uh, professor Bergos, in my opinion, epitomizes what I would call uh, a Renaissance man, to some extent. He's very eclectic, he's somewhat of a polymath, and as you will note, having, if you read through the information provided in the program, in addition to his many accomplishments in the area of educational technology, he also, quite unusually, holds five doctoral degrees. One in communication, one in computer science, one in education, one in anthropology, and one in business administration. And one or two are usually the most, uh, usually the best for most of us. So five is indeed an accomplishment. The title of Professor Birgos' address to us this afternoon is, is, is transgenic learning a radical boost for innovative education? And I'm quite sure that, like myself, you're familiar with the term transgenic in terms of GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. So it somewhat piqued my interest to see the term related to a discussion on learning. I can perhaps assume or presume what might come next, but Professor Birgos, we look forward to this very intriguing talk with this intriguing title. And at this point, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Professor Birgos. <laughs> so, thank you so much for this lovely introduction, uh, Professor Sweeney. Thank you also uh, to Taran Academy for the nice invitation to meet my first time here in Jamaica. And I was honored when they invited me like four, five, six months ago. And I tried to put together an interesting, a different approach. Um, I think I'm in the right place because I was uh, just having lunch full of chemists and physicists and, and this is completely different. So maybe you will hear something a little of the usual book, which is quite, quite okay, just at least to pick the curiosity, which I appreciate. So thank you everyone for the warm welcome uh, to this beautiful country, I suppose, because I didn't leave this, um, uh, this lodge yet, but I will, I will try. Um, the talk today, I will squeeze it, because now it's two o'clock in the afternoon. We were supposed to start at one o'clock in the afternoon, so one hour ago. So I will try to squeeze it a little so we don't extend too much the journey um, of today. My question is, we have education, we have the academy world, we all here are 
professors, full professors, halfway professors, okay? And the point is that uh, something needs to change. Something has to change. Because we are very traditional yet. When lecturing, when assessing, when grading, when we are very traditional. And I'm going to try to explain in a few slides, like 50 or 60, not, not too many, okay? My point of view, okay? First, let me point out this address here, this hashtag, transgenic learning. You can go there, you can post there, Twitter. You can read what others did in a different workshops around the world. It's a very nice place just to retrieve comments from your colleagues from other places and even from here if you stick around for a few days. So transgenic learning is the hashtag. Let me <coughs> tell you also a couple of announcements and a couple of ads about a few special issues in case you are interested. The first one is about this, learning analytics and distance education. If you are interested to uh, submit uh, uh, a proposal, you are still in time to do so. Distance education is, uh, the, the, I think, is the oldest journal focused on distance education in the world based in Australia. The second one is this one that I think that you will love more because it's focused on sensors, physical sensors and also uh, virtual sensors to improve, to boost technology enhanced learning. If you're interested, the link is down there so you can go also there and retrieve the call for papers if you want. Since I will be handing over my presentation to the organizers, maybe you don't even need to write down the link so you can take it later, okay? But in case of doubt, I will be here for until Friday so you can ask me directly, no problems. And the third one is this one, so you speak French or write in French, I have here around there. There is another, uh, another um, call for papers, another special issue. In this case, focused on integration. Uh, irradiation, integration of formal and informal learning in this uh, journal, everything in French, distance and mediation de savoir. So if you are interested, any of them are still welcoming, um, interesting and killing papers. So a little from myself, uh, this is the world sort of, and I come from here, from Europe. In case you are a little distracted, in Europe, we also have this country, Spain, this is my country. I don't live there, I live in Brussels, but this is my country, Spain. And in Spain, this is La Rioja, very well pronunciation, very good there, okay? So, um, La Rioja is in the north, sort of, it's cold, now it's minus five, minus seven. So coming here now, one day ago, is sort of a shock for me, not just for the culture, also for the temperature. I'm still in the adaptation role, okay, it's acclimatization. So if you want to go there, you're welcome, all of you are welcome. La Rioja is a very friendly place with a lot of wine. La Rioja, the best wine in the world, of course. So my university, Universidad Internacional de, de La Rioja, International University of La Rioja, it's an online university, just online university, for people all over the world in Spanish. We teach in Spanish, we research in English, but we teach in Spanish. You can go there, we have a lot of figures. For instance, it's just 27,000 students, 1,000 faculty and 5,500 staff. And we um, now provide service to 140, over 140 uh, degrees. 100 online, I said, premises in Spain and across Latin America, and 17 European funded projects and 12 projects, research projects, around 30 so far, which is not bad. Very much focused on my topic, sorry, but uh, they are also focused on health and law and chemistry, by the way, a, a number of things. Uh, we have uh, 100 research agreements across the world. Let's try if this works. I hope that this ha doesn't happen the same that happened to my colleague this morning with the technicalities, okay, which is not uh, the case, I hope. And we have also, we host chairs uh, from UNESCO, ICD, IBM, Telefonica, a number of places. These are, these are the, this is the fact sheet for the university. So when I speak now, I speak from practice. The next things that I will talk to you, I will talk about practice of dealing with 30,000 students abroad across the world, over 80 countries, distributed in 80 countries, day by day, across over 100 degrees. This meaning practical issues with the students, with teachers, with lecturers, with professors, with administrative people, okay? 
This is my lab, Unirai Tech is called, and we work with educational technology, educational innovation. Up there, I don't know if there is a pointer here, I guess that there is a pointer, maybe this is a pointer, maybe this is a pointer. Well, anyway, up there, itech.unir.net, you can retrieve all the information about our projects, research projects, and also teaching activities, okay? Everything is focused on educational technology and educational innovation. And the slogan, with all these topics there, the slogan is better learning, better teaching. This is what we do. And this is one unique feature. We are not focused just on the student. Come on, enough. The students have all the attention of the world. We just focus also on the teachers. The teachers are part of the process. We are part of the process. Hey, we're a team. So we need some care in our life. So we also focus on the teaching stuff, not just on the students, which is okay, okay? So we try to combine both. So the actual presentation starts now before the pre, okay? And the actual presentation says that the uh, sustainable development goals from uh, the UN are also inherited by UNESCO, which I work with as a UNESCO chair on e-learning, which is quite challenging, by the way, um, <clears throat> and rewarding, I have to say, because you are recording this, no? It's challenging and rewarding. I'm very happy to be a UNESCO chair, very happy. So the sustainable goal says that education, number four, is one key of the 17 goals one of the 17 goals. But education is not just education per se, it's not isolated. Education is cross topic in my view. And this is what I defend. So if we go education is related to decent work and economic growth, to good health and well-being, to zero hunger, to responsible, to reduced inequalities, to peace, to peace, to energy, to a number of things. So when we work on education, in fact, we just don't work on secondary, primary, university, higher education. This is not the case. We work for the society, across the society, with the society. This means that education can work in many different levels, many different layers, without actually working with them, okay? But we can work along with, okay? So, what is the current state of education in the world? I think it's overwhelming. Why? Because we have too much of everything. You know, it's like going to the market and have all the cells full of stuff and you have to select and pick up there. So let me get a couple of pictures here for you. If we talk about the students, you have the title of the slide on top and later the picture, okay? If we talk about the students, when the student gets enrolled the very first year and he's 18, 19, 17, okay, years old, he thinks, oh my God, at least 10 years of my life, because he's the bachelor, the master, another master, the language, maybe I go outside, I come back, the stage, the practice in, in a company, if I go for a PhD, it's a, you can raise a kid, or maybe two even in this time. So everything is like this. This is the highest Catholic uh, cathedral in the world. It's in Germany. It's called Ulm, in the village called Ulm in Germany. It's 152 meters uh, to the top, okay? It's really tall. I took this picture myself. If we talk about educational methodology, this is the Big Bang, very traditional. This is what we do. Why? Because we have the objectives, the competencies, the table of content, the assessment, another module. Objectives, competencies, okay, this is the way. And we should be like this. This is my nephew, by the way. My... So the point is, he's reading, he's exploring things, okay? So this is really nice. We should combine the tradition with exploring thingy naturally from the baby. And we should push this. So far, we're very stuck on the left, and we should combine to the right too. This is the academic management. This is a nice lady playing with water and glasses, okay? Everything in tune, playing Mozart, okay? And this is very stressing, I guess because everything has to be in tune, too much water, too little water, evaporation, you break the glass, and still you can play, you can perform. If you are an academic manager, you know what I'm talking about. You have to be all the time with the sticks and the plates like in the Chinese circus. It's exactly the same. And if you talk about faculty members, you, we all are faculty members here, okay? This is what we do, the orchestra man. We play the guitar and with the feet we move the puppets and later we splash the, okay? Everything is like that. And every time, even more and more and more. Because you have to be a good teacher, but also a researcher. 
but also a budget retrieval. You have to go for funding raising, and also you have to report, and also you have to talk to the parents. You have to be the perfect guy, which we are, by the way. But this, nonetheless, is really difficult for us. So we need a disruptive solution. The solution cannot be that everything is a huge cathedral with a puppet master and, uh, and breaking glasses. Too much. This is too much. We are simply people. We are teachers. We are, this is not the right business. We were talking around the table when we were having lunch. If we went here, we were here for money, we should be playing football, soccer, or something like that, okay? This is not for money. If we want recognition, we should be Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, Usain Bolt, eh, from the country. We should be something like that. We are just simple teachers. So we should simplify the process. We should stick to our role, stick to our functions, and to our expected outcomes, instead of doing a little of everything, which diminishes the impact of everything. So, we need a transgenic solution. Think about transgenic and now forget it, because this is just a metaphor. Nothing to do with transgenic food, nothing to do with transgenic chicken. And there is a newspaper, I think a news yesterday today, about a Chinese lab, a Chinese hospital, just with a, a couple of babies, a new um, race. Um, I don't know, this is not about this. This is a metaphor, a metaphor. So even if you are pro or against, forget it. It's just a brandy name, sexy name. I was speaking for this, about this thing for 10 years, and nobody actually cared. Nobody paid attention. I changed the name and suddenly, chan, I have a keynote here, a book there, people like, it's catchy. It's just for branding, it's an ad, no more than that, okay? But the metaphor stands, and the metaphor stands for this. Genetically modified organisms, GMO, are mm, organisms that are change somehow in the core to produce something different. For instance, with the scissoring, this is the technique applied to the babies, these newborn babies in China, from China. Talking about this with some chemist here, maybe it's a little for work for me, from me, so if I see something wrong, please don't take it into consideration. I didn't study chemistry yet, but in the future, who knows, okay? And this happens also with the in vitro fecundation. It's exactly the same process. This is happening, but this is happening also with diabetes, okay? With the insulin. All the insulin in the world is transgenic, because if you extract from the pigs, from the pancreas, and you want to create and reproduce and replicate and adapt to the human being, there are not enough pigs in the world to do so. Everything is transgenic, and soya is transgenic, and many good things are transgenic. Penicillin is transgenic. And also this example, the golden rice, the Le Riz Doré, okay? So you have the white rice, you change the genes there, you add two genes, I don't know which one, sorry, I'm not an expert, and you put vitamin A, and you change the color. And now it's yellow, it's golden. And what happens with vitamin A? That you fight the blindness. So people whose diet, daily intake comes from just rice, like in Southeast Asia, for instance, okay, that they start in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night, and they just eat rice in many countries with a little grocery there. They can fight the blindness directly just eating the rice growing from the ground, okay? So this is transgenic. They had something white, they had something extra, they had a modified organism, and they look for an improvement, a change, in this case, fighting, fighting blindness, okay? So this is the concept. If we go into the education, let's go a little, a little farther, because this is a metaphor, okay? Remember, it's a metaphor. I'm not against or protogenic. My wife is toxicologist, so I hired the term from her. That's it, no more. The point is, this is like a Lego. Lego exists here in Jamaica, the, the, the blocks, okay? You, this, it's, it's called Lego here too? Okay, good. So if you go to a kid and you hand over a number of pieces, all of them blue, the guy will say, okay, this is funny for five minutes, but I, 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 everything blue, I need, I need colors in my life. Is what the usual guy will say there, five year old, eight year old. So you can take one of the blocks, you can color it in red, for instance, and you put it back. 
and you can do this process a number of times. So if you take something that you don't like, or you prefer in a different way, or you can improve somehow, or you can adapt to the target, you change it and you put it back. This is the transgenic process, in fact, okay? But in this case, apply to level. If we go into the uh, usual umbrella of education, there are a number of concepts, stakeholders, pieces of information. For instance, teachers training, content creation, licensing, exploitation, assessment, competencies. There are parts of the structure, okay? Maybe you don't like it, but all of them work like a clock. In this case, I put there an Itilus clock, okay, a Fibonacci series. You go a little bigger and bigger every time and you learn and learn and learn, or you don't because you know we are human beings and maybe we don't learn in, on every round. Some people don't earn lap after lap. But in principle, you should learn a little more and expand your wiseness, okay, a little more. This is the case. So you have a number of pieces and maybe like Lego pieces and maybe you don't like it and you don't like one of them, assessment, this is the usual thing for teachers, lectures, professors, mentors, call it the way you want, okay? Assessment, we don't like the assessment from others because it's too long, too short, it's not to the point. I would put it in English, I would put it in French, I would, everything is different. Online, face to face, we are really picky with the assessment, okay? So we don't like it. We don't need to change everything. This is stupid. We don't need to bear whatever is there. We can just get whatever we don't like it, we modify it and we put it back. And that's it. It's very simple, quick, effective, productive, innovative education. It's very logical, very simple. But not many people do that because we also think that the methodology is different and the assessment is different and the table of content is different and we have to start from scratch. Because if we don't start, we are not educators, like Confucius. Okay, you are not Confucius. We are not Confucius. We are simple teachers. We have to be productive. And we have to be innovating every month, in every class, in every degree. And not waiting for a huge, from scratch, change. Because this will not happen ever. To make it informal education, you should wait for the education, the Ministry of Education. You should wait for the regional accreditation agency. You should wait for, waiting for, waiting for, waiting for all the time. And this is stupid. You can produce a number of changes immediately with immediate impact in your classes, in your performance and in the performance of your students. So, this is already in motion. Steve Jobs, example of transgenic innovation, in this case applied to a different thing than education. Steve Jobs, this guy, he was a god, he was not a god, <laughs> just to be polite, for many people, okay? This guy didn't create, didn't invent the mobile phone, even didn't invent the tablet that was there before that. I was using tablets before Steve Jobs was in, on a scene, okay? On, on stage, and, and we could do it. However, he gave a twist, a different twist. Took the mobile phone, like this one, by the way, this is Android, this is Samsung, <laughs> this is a different this is competence. So, uh, point with this is that he took something that was working, gave it a twist, and put it back in the market. And suddenly, cha-cha, 50% of the market. Okay? Steve Jobs. With nothing new, just something modified. Bill Gates, this guy with the polar coat, this is Bill Gates, okay? And you maybe you don't recognize him because now he's drinking a glass of Isis, okay? Poo poo, a glass. He's just in front of a purified plant of turning Isis into water, okay? He's very stick to that because recently he announced also the tox toilets, okay? Just to produce toilets for the third world, okay? So um, what did he do? He maybe took something that was already there, like a computer, made a twist and put it back in the market. He took the idea of the ISIS from the salinization, the seawater, changed it in the process and put it back in the market. It's a twist. What we need is a twist. We don't need to start from scratch if we have it, but we all are not genius, all of us. Maybe some of you, but this is not the case. We have to be very practical. If you are a genius, maybe you die and you are acknowledged later. And we need to do it now with our people now, okay? So take something that you don't like, that you want to make different, change it and put it back. It happens also with Elon Musk, before he's completely, along with the stock options, the car. It's a car. 
cars for one one hundred years. It's a car. He put a battery there, like a battery for the for the blender, exactly the same, but a different way. And now you have a five hundred miles autonomy car, okay, which is quite okay. But if you see. Nothing really new, just the application, the innovation is changing something. And it happens also with Branson, Richard Branson, you know, the Virgin Records, the guy that found Madonna and raised Madonna to the top, okay? And also you have Virgin Atlantics, and also you have the Virgin Trains in, in, uh, in London, in UK, okay? Virgin, taking trains and putting it a different way. Taking planes now, putting it a different way. This here is called SpaceX, I think is the name. I know, I'm not sure, Virgin, whatever. And now this guy, what is doing? You go into a plane, he takes you to the stratosphere or wherever it is, and you leave the zero gravity for three minutes, and you go down. And he guy takes the tickets for $250,000. I think that they give you champagne in the beginning, just as a counter, okay? So, but nothing new. It's just, a, they call it spacewalk. I don't know, you are not in the space, you are in between, it's a walk, you, you are not walking, and it's like three or five minutes. And he's selling the tickets, okay? A visionary, really good for his business. But nothing new, it's a different approach, okay? We should do this into education. So, Albert Einstein said that doing the same thing over and over again is stupid. Okay? It's the definition of insanity. And I think that we all agree on that. Well, Benjamin Franklin also said that. You will never know. You can go, in fact, to this here, wisdom quotes, and you can take your own wise quotation and put it back in the mouth of something preferably already dead, so he cannot complain about what he said or he didn't say, okay? But the truth here sticks. If we do over and over again, and we take the people into the classroom, and we say, please, switch off your mobiles, because I'm speaking, I'm really important, you have to be listening to me. Okay, you have to earn that. You have to earn that. You know, Rubinstein, Arthur Rubinstein, you know, the famous piano player, um, he said that getting the final applause from everyone there in the, in the audience, it was pretty easy. Getting the silence during the performance was the difficult part, okay? So we can go there and say, please don't touch your mobile phones. You have to earn it. But maybe we can just flip over the omelet on the pan. And we can say, no, you take off your mobiles and use it right now and search for this and share with your friend and use WhatsApp and now, now you're in the classroom. So we can adapt and it's very simple. It's a slight adaptation of what we do to produce a highest impact, okay? So, the Lego, okay, keep the mind. I think that in a couple of months or maybe tomorrow you will not remember my name, which is not bad, no problem at all, but remember the metaphor, remember the metaphor. Remember the red piece of Lego coming back to say hi to the blue pieces of Lego, okay? So, I suggest, I propose three radical innovations in education. Three transgenic education, um, innovations in education, okay? The first one is this here. Formal and informal integrated. Make a guess, okay? I'm a professor here and I speak, blah, 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 and I have one classroom and one lesson every week for a couple of hours to the same group. This means two hours out of 24 hours times seven days. It's stupid to think that in my two hour SIP classroom, I will say enough to convince, to engage, to teach properly. I should be this guy spiking the people up, but I cannot be the only source of information. This is stupid. I'm not Santo Tomás de Aquino. I'm not. I cannot be. I shouldn't be the only source of information. So they can come to my classroom, they can come to my lesson, and I can talk, guide, explore, okay? Be the supervisor. That's it. But the people are responsible. They are responsible for their own learning. So you provide the guidance and they play around. This is exactly what you should do. So we should combine formal and informal. So we have the textbook and we have the competencies and the targets, but we can also provide suggested links and give the example and you go there, out there and come back with the answer. 
I don't matter exactly why and how you do it. You come back with the answer to the problem. It's like a, the problem solving approach, okay? You state the problem and people come back with the answer. So, for instance, practical examples. This is called FADA. FADA is the first repository in Arabic for Arabic resources. And it combines Mahara, I say names just in case you know them, Mahara repository with Moodle Learning Management System, with DSpace, Open Repository, put them together in a single sign-on, meaning that you just have to write your email once and not three times, and they combine everything in one single tool, completely transparent for the users. What is the actual upside of this? What is the actual one? That these people work in Palestine, where all the territory is split in different places where people cannot freely go from one to the other because there are other countries in between. So if you are in the left side and you want to study on the right side, maybe you cannot do it. But if you have a centralized repository with your studies there and it's open and it's for free, maybe you can. And this is really improving the level of the academic performance of students in Arab countries and specifically in Palestine. Second one, Open Educational Resources University from New Zealand and for the Commonwealth. This guy here, Wayne McIntosh, he's a, he's a very well-known UNESCO and Cole, you know Commonwealth of Learning, uh, uh, chair. This guy here put together one formula and the formula that a number of universities can share resources, open educational resources, so people can actually take the courses no matter where they register to. So the point is that coming from uh, Atabasca University, for instance, you can take the courses and later you can get the examination in a different university. So you can save content because if my brother or sister university is doing exactly the same, why should they replicate? I actually reroute the students to their resources and I take back the competencies and I grade these competencies. So they can actually share the model and share the contents, okay? This is Atlas Emundus. I was part of this project. This is like Google Maps. If you see, exactly like Google Maps. But all the circles there point out to specific open educational resources across the world. So you have an actual visual repository of the resources. Okay, you click in New Zealand or wherever, in Paris or here in Jamaica, and you can find where these resources are. So you can get in contact with the people that have produced and you can download the resources if you want. So you can use the world of open educational resources for you. None of these three cases are really new, completely new. They are just an adaptive innovation or something that was already happening. Google Maps, a repository, an accreditation model, but it's working, it's a different twist. This is what I actually sell here. So, about the institutions, Kiron. Kiron is providing services for immigrants coming from Syria and Lebanon to Europe with all this migration crisis that we got. When they arrive to Europe, since they are not the Bologna, the Bologna is the educational umbrella for accreditation and acknowledgement of uh, university credits, their studies coming from the original countries are not recognized in the host countries. So people having a three-year bachelor in chemistry, they cannot go for the master's because it's not recognized. There is no acknowledgement at all. What these people do is that they get agreements with universities, mainly in France and Germany, to acknowledge the previous knowledge and to continue the education from the very same place with a number of complements to the next level based on open educational resources. So people don't actually have to pay the textbook. So they recognize first benefit. The second one is that they have they don't have to buy the textbooks. So it's also saving money for that. This is called Kiron, okay? This one here is Khan Academy that I guess that all of you will know, okay? To learn maths in a funny way, with a funny guy, blah, 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 blah for free. This one is Atabasca University, uh, the open university in the English part of Canada, okay? And these guys 
you can enroll in computer science, bachelor in computer science, bachelor of science in computer science, okay? And the first year is fully online based in open educational resources. Everything there. So instead of paying 6,000 uh, Canadian dollars, you pay 3,000, half of it, because you save the 3,000 actually assigned to textbooks and practical material. And everything is online and for free. What is the business here? That they are actually making double the number of, uh, of uh, enrolled people. So, actually speaking, everything is even. They get more students, but they save money, all of them. So you can actually spread more, and in this case, the computer science, okay? So, YouTube, why not? There are so many things that are not so good. I will, I will go to say like crap, but maybe I just not tolerate it here. But they are, they are really crap, okay, really bad, really bad, yeah. But they are also very good stuff. And we, as a learning supervisors, meaning lectures, meaning uh, teachers, it's our responsibility to take these and select the best things to provide there. This is a practical example of using informal learning, meaning YouTube, into our formal lessons, because I am a professor of educational whatever or chemistry, okay? But you can use a video in YouTube. It's not forbidden. And many people don't use it because they think it's forbidden, because it's not allowed from the accreditation, from the university, because people think that using YouTube will actually diminish the effort and will get the level down and my quality as a professor will be really down and the university go to the street. It's really stupid, okay? But this is happening all the time. This is what we get when we run the workshop with teachers. So you can use YouTube or you can use Merlot. Merlot is a repository for uh, academic programs, okay? And pro for lesson plans. You have, I think it's over 20,000 or 30,000 lesson plans for free. So you can get the idea of I want to give a a speech in English, a collaborative class about biology, a learning about gardening, whatever. And I don't have uh, the idea all the time. You go here, you uh, Google, you look for that, you retrieve the lesson plan, you adapt it, and you put it back if you want. Okay? And this is informal, apply, integrated completely. It's happening for the last 10 years. And it's really useful. If you don't know it, maybe you should. Really nice for the next case that you want to start something from scratch. It's not required that you start something from scratch. Okay, no need. Chemistry is there all over the years and physics, uh, physics, it's called physics, no? And physics and computer science and engineering of every type, okay? You can adapt it. So, this is the first idea. I can give you an example about how to... <coughs> Sorry, I catch a cold. Uh, and my bus is a little broken. An idea about how to do this. This is a video repository. This is a practical case. In my university, we have TV, UNIR NET, which is a digital repository in Spanish, 90%, 10% in English, but everything almost in Spanish. Um, what we provide is free access to a number of people, register access a number of people, and to the educational community, another portion of the access, with a number of services. Roughly 20% for free, 20% for register, 60% for the community. This means that 40% people can get access to video lectures, video posts, open classes, okay? We are recording 1,700 lessons every week. 17, 1,700 every week. For the last nine years, this means roughly uh, 500,000 pieces there. Learning pieces, content pieces, learning pieces. You can call it the way you want, but out of 500, you have 200, uh, 400,000, Two, two, I say four, no? So 200,000 for free. This means a lot. And you can put there in the market. And this is, what is the innovation here? Because we didn't start, this is a big repository, that's it. You give a different twist about the access, a freemium access, okay? And you put it there in the market. This is happening also with the open uh, policy that we bought there, open policy. Um, so we have the commitment coming from every single person in the boards, the financial, the fiscal, the legal, the academic board, to use open educational resources, to create open educational resources in the formal academic programs and across the university. From here to 2020, we have a commitment 
of we have a, a delta there of 15% or 70%, I don't know what. Something realistic, okay? Nothing new, but we give a twist. We something different. We color in red something to put it back there in the market. The second idea is about transgenic learning and learning analytics. Pretty simple. I will give a couple of slides. I'm, I guess that you are aware about what learning analytics is. So, very simple. If you have 1,000 students, 1,000 students in your classroom because you are virtual, we are virtual, and we have 1,000 student classrooms, okay? So, if you have one this, how can you actually personalize learning or teaching to 1,000 people at the same time? You cannot. But you can get data from what they do online. And you can ask a number of questions like these ones, for instance. For what exactly do you need data? Who? Student, professor, administrator? How much? 1,000, 100? From where? The age, the curricula, the background, the objectives? What? Should say they are what? What type of reports are expected? At last, with whom? Type of answer, interaction, a number of questions. We should write our academic profile of what we need to provide this specific personalized approach to students and to teachers. So we can get like this. This is a dashboard. Very simple. Nowadays, everybody knows apps. Eh? At least in our mobiles, we have installed three or 300 apps. Okay? Very simple. Back in the days, it was really a, a, a very, I don't know, curiosity, just to say, to be some uh, polite enough. So the point is that we can get through the dashboard the information that we want. For instance, on the pie on the right that we have red, the, you know, the traffic light um, formula, usual legend, the right, the red, the yellow, the blue, okay? We have all these colors. We can actually group students. So we don't provide personalized learning, support to the learners, thinking that personalization means individualization. Because we can group people based on what they do. And you will have the slow learners, the fast learners, the half half learners, the visual learners, the text based learners, the guys, and you put a number of groups there, usually five or six, no more than that. And out of 1,000, you can get 100 here, 200 there, 300 there, 100 there, and you get your five, six groups based on those colors, the red, the blue, the yellow. So when you actually get the red ones, you mean the, uh, the alarm ones, you can go there and provide something specific for the group not just for every single individual. It will go to every single individual, but you don't have to tackle with every uh, single student, just the group that they are working on. And you, someone stands for whatever out, you can, of course, go there. But you can actually accelerate the process of personalization based on data, simple data. Data coming from the user tracking, data that are always, also and already happening in, in, in Google or in iOS. It doesn't matter, okay? So you retrieve all this information and do it back some analysis and apply a specific solution for the students. So number three, and this is the last solution, is called SOS. You are smart people. I know that you get the double meaning of the word, okay? SOS. What is SOS? Support online services. Meaning that we can actually provide these as a breakthrough in the educational methodology. So, we have three levels. The descriptive part, to say what is happening, the predictive part, what will happen, and the prescriptive part, what we have to do to make things happening, even when we have to do nothing, like with the placebo, okay? Just the self-suggestion, okay? The point is that doing this approach, we are working on prediction, on estimates, on artificial intelligence, whatever that means, okay? So we take the data out of people and we try to predict what will happen after. For instance, the dropout rate. I know that you would love to know which ones out of your class will fall before the end. Because if they fall, why to pay attention? 
if they fall before and if they drop before, maybe they need an extra support or they are really, really bad and we completely leave them alone. In terms of resources, this is crucial. In terms of management too, in terms of teaching also. Attrition, teacher's attrition. How do you get burned out out of teaching the same subject year after year? If I am a, a manager and I'm a, I'm a vice director, in fact, I would love to know which part of my team out of 1,000 faculty members are in risk, at risk of get all this attrition back enough to drop out before the end of the course, before the end of the semester, or before the subject. So this, top, uh, this type of estimates of predictions will actually provide a benefit to the group, to the student, and to the teacher. And um, what is the answer to all this? The answer is pretty simple. It's a piece of cake. Again, the double meaning, because you are smart. The double meaning, okay? You will not remember my name, but you will remember the piece of cake, okay? I had a teacher that always said, put examples based on food, and people will remember the food, and, and they will not remember your name. And he's right, I don't remember his name, ever. I don't know if it was Alexander or... Oh, I don't know, Peter, I, I don't remember. But he was explaining things with cake, so I just hijacked this and it's now my cake, okay? The piece of cake, chocolate, of course, what else? So, pretty simple. You have the lower layer focused on working with data and estimates for students and to peers, meaning that the students can also teach other students. You know that, okay? Peer review, peer assessment, peer commenting, peer having drinks, peer, everything, okay? The second layer is focused on the faculty, meaning the tutors, the professors, the academic staff, any type of academic staff, teacher's assistant, for instance. The third one is the administrative staff, which is also important, because administrative staff is the actual core of the university. It's not us. Hey, sorry, surprise. We are just the teachers. We're just a very single piece there in the, in the food chain, okay? Because when I'm a student and I get enrolled, the first phase is not the teacher. The first phase is the administrative guy in the front desk. And if he or she is nice or is not nice, it's the first impression that the potential enrolled student will have from the university. So administrative staff is key. It's the people that pay your bills reimbursement when you come back from a trip like this. Is the people that actually proceed with the signature of the contracts is the key. They are working there in the pipes, okay? But they are working. So they are part of the process. They also require these support services. And last one, all these support services for them, okay? So this is the cake. Pretty simple, pretty difficult to produce. So we have a number of services that we can produce, for instance. To students, personalization, individualization for learning, support academic, semi-automatic services based on estimates and prediction, semi-automatic grading of the examinations, for instance, support to administrative staff, estimate of potential dropout, they need to know, to calculate, the right, to make the right calculations for the resources for the second semester, for instance. And last one, the economic committees, very, very important because, of course, everything is a business and everything needs a budget. So for instance, we can give a personal recommendation to friends or a conversion rate of potential customer register a student, okay? A number of things. So getting all this data and providing some estimates thinking into the future is good for everyone in the community. The students, the professors, the administrative staff, and the managers. And this is disrupted. This is transgenic. This means that we can get something that is already there, for instance, all the user tracking information, <clears throat> in fact, a huge database, a huge Excel sheet, and give, them, give all this a different view, a different approach to provide back useful reports for everyone. A last application, the blockchain. Everybody talks about blockchain, nobody actually knows what blockchain is, and blockchain education even less, okay? But for instance, blockchain, which is something pretty simple, by the way, exists for the last 40 years in a different way of application. I think it's the same, okay? It's just to have the, the host and the receiver with the same understanding, just to not to be too technical, okay? So it can be applied in education to authentication, digital identity, data storage, 
<coughs> file transfer gaming, a number of things. We can use it. Something that is already there in the market, put it in our university to make everything faster, better, more secure, or whatever you want to do with that, okay? So, summary, and I'm almost close to the end. The first one is open science. Open science is one key to us to make a disruptive boost into education, this transgenic part. Please use open education, open data, open research, open research results, open templates, open discussions, open for whatever in your actual lecturing, in your every single day lecturing. It's good for everyone. Let your students work, explore and come back with new resources. It's good for everyone. Second thing, formal and informal integrated. Please use YouTube, use Wikipedia, okay, a lot of things that shouldn't be there, but a lot of things that are really good. Your duty, your responsibility is select the good stuff and provide it back. But you don't need to create videos from scratch. Why? There are so many things that are well explained. Khan Academy, okay? If you want to explain maths, go to Khan Academy, select number 1, 7, and 144, and come back. And you put the wrapper, you put the layer there, the coating, the chocolate coating, and explain why and what for, and this is expected and this is not, and blah, blah, blah. But the actual resource, the blah, blah, is, worth, is, is yours. I was combining here, it's fine, sorry. But the core of this content could be already there and you save a lot of money and time and you are always up to date. Third one, data analysis for personalization. To students, to mentors, professors, academic staff, to administrative staff and to management, to all the layers of the cake in the university, not just to teachers. And I finish with a joke. I guess that you will feel identified somehow, okay? The PhD candidates say, and then a miracle occurs, like there in the middle. And the PhD supervisor say, I think that you should be more specific here. And you should put something there. This is something that usually happens all the time. Also, when we teach, someone comes with a crazy idea that should be a little more on the ground. And you are the people, we are the people, that should put this idea on the ground to make things happen. These are my contact information, my contact details, my email, the website, and also the Twitter, should you want to get in contact with me for whatever reason, which will be a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. to thank uh, Professor Bergos for his presentation. I think we have about 10 minutes or so for questions and answers, please. In response to a very lively, very animated presentation, very thought-provoking presentation, I think. Come on, show me that you were not yeah, sleeping no, I think after I think lunch. After lunch, yes. Yeah, this is challenging. Tara, you should put me a little more up in the skill. <laughs> Please, any question? The woman there. You mean the one in Arabic, Faba, or the TV one, the video cast one? Okay, uh, all of them are focused on actually on actual content, content for teaching. They are lectures, okay? Lectures of in the concept of a short one, a long one. Maybe it can be a long semester one. Can be just one piece of knowledge for the afternoon. Okay, it it varies a lot. But this all is focused in content. The point is that if you get the resource, the actual core of the content. You can actually decorate the content with your uh, knowledge and expectations for the student yourself. So what you get is the content and you save time and money without creating that content, but adapting to your rationale, adapting your, to your script in the classroom. This is the idea.
Yes, the copyright thing is one, uh, it's a very interesting, it's a matter for a, a, a different complementary speech, okay? But the licensing issue in this case is that you keep the authorship, whoever it is, and you can reuse it for free as long as you cite the author. It's for free. It doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want with that without naming the original author. You have to name the owner of that, okay? In this case, the author and the owner are the same person. But as long as you name it and you cite the right source, you can do anything, okay? You acknowledge the guy and that's it, for free. Usually when you retrieve this information, you can, if it's video, it's just final video, it's a video card. But when you retrieve, uh, for instance, a Word document, it's completely open and free, okay? So you can get the editing source, not the PDF that you cannot change, the editing source, so you can actually use it, reuse it, copy paste it, whatever you want, okay? As long as you name the author. Thank you for your question. Please. There we have. It's on, right. Um, I was asking about the journals that you had. In the um, beginning? Yes. Okay. And you also mentioned something about them being open access. Okay. So I was asking if, let's say, that any of us wanted to submit an article to the journal, is it free um, to submit the journal or would we have to pay and then everybody else who access it, access it for free? Okay. I, I understood the same thing, but thank you so much for saying again out loud. Uh, usually, you know, the open access journals are a trick because it's open access is not a free publishing. It's not the same. Usually there's a misleading definition between open, free, and universal. They are not the same thing. Can be open, but not for everyone, and it still is open. I have an Egyptian partner who owns a MOOC for their students there at the Cairo University. And it's open for 40,000 students at Cairo University out of 200,000 students enrolled. It's open for them, but it's not open for me. Is this still open or it is not? It's good for 40,000 people enough to be open, has to be universally open. These are two different concepts, complementary or not. So open and free are not always the same. So open journal access is open access no free publishing. So if I have to submit something, I should pay for the publishing because they have to make money. It's their business. In this case, these three ones or the others, it doesn't matter. You are, well, distance education, for instance, is not open, but the other two are open access. But you have to pay for publish there, okay? For publishing there. It's the usual business model for open journal access is someone has to pay. This is the paradox of uh, open and free. Maybe it's free for me. For instance, Wi-Fi is a very simple example. Wi-Fi here, yeah, it's open and free. Yeah, to me. But the people here, for sure, have to pay. And the people who rent the room here, gas, have to pay. It's open and free for me, but someone has to pay. If not, there is no business and it's not maintained, okay? Please. Thank you so much for your spirit and talk. I, I appreciate the point. I appreciate very much the point about asking young people to take their devices out. And I've used it myself. I said, take it out. OK, what do you find on that? Somebody says, and you talk about that. Or make a tweet about that, you know? Because the more you talk about it, the more it becomes familiar, and familiarity is good for study. Um, my problem, though, is when you send them now and say, go and, 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 and research this and come back so we can have a discussion. When you come back, few people engage with the process. Few people talk. How do I, and I've been struggling with this. You mean when they are back at home no, no, and they have they to come back? back in a okay. discussion, and I have discussion. to guide this, okay. you know, they go to read something and I want to engage mm -hmm. them to see what's there and how they are processing so I can guide it. My problem is that many, majority of my students aren't engaging with the process. They aren't going to read the thing and then when they come, they don't want to talk. So I need to hear what strategies you have to help me to overcome this. Punishment, of course. <laughs> 
So you are you are talking about a transcendental um, question for humanity, humankind these days, meaning that, um, for instance, my kid. <laughs> so I have it at home. Your problem, I have it at home. Uh, the, the point is that um, we are growing really dysfunctional, socially dysfunctional kids. Even ourselves, okay? We are all the time. Today I just brought one, but they have three. Okay, and I have two laptops, another one desktop, whatever, I don't know, maybe nine or ten screens in my life. Of course, I, I, I make a living out of this, okay? But my kid could have three or four uh, between the, 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 the brothers and the colleagues and whatever. And the point is that we are raising people there that are very good at chatting and whatsapping and tweeting. So the level of uh, the, the, the depth there about the analysis that is like a tweet, like 140 characters. But they are not actually developing a, a deeper sense of of understanding or of discussion or many things. And even worse, when they come back, they are completely socially impaired to interact with others. This is happening all the time. I think it's part of this all this multi-screen thing is completely, you know, the the devil there. Okay, it's completely there. So uh, the soft skills. And the transversal competencies, meaning uh, analysis, cross-referencing, speaking in public, discussion, are completely just going down and down and down in favor of more technical issues. What is the solution for that? I actually would kill internet a few hours a day. Yeah, I would, I would go to UNESCO, UN, or wherever, someone that actually matters, like Coca-Cola, or, you know, actually rules the world. And I would say, come on, guy, from six to eight, no internet for everyone. So for nobody there, so uh, you cannot actually go there and WhatsApp in the guy just uh, shoulder to shoulder because this is, this is happening all the time, okay? So you have to do the old style school there. For instance, go to the street, you know, I kick the ball. No, come on, I WhatsApp. Eh? This is what's happening. So I will go for something really drastic. Since I don't have much hope on the Coca-Cola world, uh, as a parent, I would say in my house, you go out, you will do your homework, later I give you the mobile and I let you be there on for one hour, okay, two hours, 30 minutes, it depends, Saturday mornings, whatever, but something a little restricted, the 24 seven access to technology communication, online interaction, actually is a pain to the actual life interaction with people. If I was a teacher for primary, secondary, I would do so. If I was a parent just with a, when my kid is 21 years old, okay, so now he can not follow my rules. But uh, well, uh, you know, a small baby, I would do so. It's part of our thing. So when I'm in classroom, in a classroom with uh, teenagers, I'm completely lost. I try to engage, I try to do things, I go there, but it depends very much on what they do, and I think uh, the worst word in the world, what they feel like. Okay, they feel like doing, great. They don't feel like doing, you are completely uh, <clears throat> screwed. Can I say that, okay? So, sorry, I don't have the answers. If I could, I would write a book. I share your concern, that's it. Sir, please. <coughs> Yes, that was the great lecture. You mentioned stats on, on dropout rate. One of the things that you should measure. I wonder if you can tell us something about the dropout rates in some of your programs. Definitely, thank you so much. Um, you know, when you work online and teach online, the dropout rate is steep because the engagement, the actual social, physical, peer-to-peer -peer engagement with people is not there. Everything is like I said before with the teenagers, what's happening? Almost, okay? The learning management system, the YouTube, but everything is between a screen and you, okay? So the actual demotivation of people is accelerated. So usually after the first month of really sparkling there, and the second month of well, the third month of and after Christmas, everybody, there is a fallout there completely. And after the Easter, half of the people are gone, okay? It is the usual process, it's like that, <laughs> completely, okay? So we have some dropout actions in place, and they are very effective. 
our dropout rate is as low as 4%. 96% of our people really gets graduated. I was in the graduation this Friday in Colombia. I came from Colombia here, to, from Bogota here. Okay, 800 people and enroll 850. Okay, this is really good. 800 people out of 850 or 60, I don't remember right now. And what do we do? We do my first and only advice about what we do, the outline there, is that we work on the personal touch. The personal touch. Because everything can be semi automatic, everything can be completely automatic. And I can get the automatic grading, the automatic enrollment, the automatic, yes, I can do it because it's not that difficult. In fact, it's computer science, computer programming. Pretty simple, 20 years ago, nowadays, you drag and drop and you have your own app in one afternoon. Pretty easy. Yes, I can do it, but I don't want to. I don't want to do it. Because if I do everything automatic in an online environment, the personal touch actually evaporates and people are looking for personal relations. They are not looking just for the students. They are not looking just for the content, just for the automatic and everything millimetric there. They are not looking for that. The system has to be efficient, but has to be personal. So what do we do? We provide a tutoring system. This is the key for success. So if you're recording this, this is the key for our university. Okay, really good. I'm giving you the, for free, the secret of our success. The tutoring layer, one of the support services, the SOS, is the tutoring layer. Meaning that every other week, so every 15 days, a guy picks up the phone and calls every single student. So far, we have around 30,000 students. 30,000 calls every 15 days. So 15 and 15, of course, because. So you pick up and say, hey, come on, how are you, Philip? And Philip is in Norway or in Sweden or in Jamaica, or wherever. How are you doing today? And it's the personal counseling. This guy is not a technical one. It's a sort of psychological support, a coach, okay? And the student, enrolled student, keeps this very same tutor across the year, all the year long, okay? So it's a friendly phase. Hey, I check your LMS activity, your learning management activity, and I just check that you didn't uh, log in for two weeks. Do you have any problem? No, I'm working too much, but you should focus because now you have activity one and activity three, okay? And you have the coach. And this is the secret. People love that. When you have the graduation ceremony last Friday, the teachers are sort of known places, known people. Is that okay? Thank you, professor, you gave me too much. But the friendly emotion, people crying and hugging is for the tutors. Hey, come on, Pepe, thanks to you, you are part of my success, you are part of my degree, you are part of my... And they hug and they cry and they take pictures. And I'm in the corner, yes, professor, professor. Yeah. They are the real important people. This is the key for the anti-dropout, okay? Any last minute burning question before we move to the next one? Someone is saying hello. <laughs> yeah, see, he's smelling very discreet, by the way, he's doing this. Any last minute question? Okay, I will be here still until Friday. I'm leaving on Friday, I, so tomorrow and the day after. So anytime, I will be very happy to discuss with you anything. Okay, thank you so much. Professor Burgess, uh, on behalf of the Cabin Academy of Sciences and the Cabin Academy of Sciences Jamaica chapter, it's my pleasure to leave this with you so that we hope that when you take it back with you, you will remember us. We were very pleased. You heard people speak of your talk as animated, spirited, great. We all concur. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I will not share with you. It's mine. <laughs>